Hi, welcome in everyone. Um, what we're doing this month, because it's Stress Awareness Month, is we are doing a panel on specifically managing stress in the workplace. We did do an episode of the Safe Space podcast live yesterday where we kind of talked about individual experiences with stress and how on a personal level you feel stress, what impacts you uh, and how you can deal with it. So what we really wanted to focus on here is more looking at work-related stress, which is, I mean, hugely prevalent in today's world anyway, but in the games industry maybe particularly um, because of, you know, some of the common issues that we talk about a lot, like crunch and burnout and just really the kind of high stakes nature seemingly uh, that the industry is is prone to because of you know a lot of people care very very deeply about the product both who work in the studio and like in terms of the customers um so we we have some lovely guests here today um that i will allow to introduce themselves in just a sec but i wanted to just make you aware of a couple of commands that we have in the chat today so um if you type exclamation mark stress then that will link to any stress related resources and these are internationally available resources on our website so if you do feel like you're struggling or you really resonate with anything that is discussed today um, then you can type that into the chat exclamation mark stress to access some resources and then we also have exclamation mark discord. Um, if you wanted to join our discord community that is open to literally anyone. Um, and it's a really inclusive, nice space uh, where people can talk about things. And I mean, hopefully de-stress, but there's also an area for folks to um, kind of vent and, and talk about things, which is often very important um, when dealing with stress. Let me just hop in here and reset you, Tammy, since you have come back. But while I'm while I'm doing that, Tammy, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and kind of tell everyone where you're from and and what you've got going on at the moment, who you are? Um, hi, yes, I'm Tamsin Olunig. I'm co-founder and chief people of the End Dreams. Uh, we're a VR developer uh, based in Farnborough in Hampshire. Um, and as a people officer, I look after HR, uh, recruitment, culture, uh, EDI, accessibility, all sorts of people related things in our business. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and Julia, would you like to to go ahead now, if that's okay? Um, sure. I'm Julia Melvin. I'm HR Projects Manager at Ubisoft Reflections and Ubisoft Limington Studios here in the UK. Um, mostly looking after well-being and uh, neurodiversity in our two studios, um, as well as a few other projects. Um, been leading our well-being program at the two studios for uh, about six years now, I'd say. Um, so a little bit of time. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Sylv, uh, I think, yeah, you're back. We can see you again. Do you want to take some time to introduce yourself? Hi there. Yeah, I'm Sylvana Greenfield. Um, I'm a health and wellness coach. And uh, previous to that, uh, I worked uh, for uh, publishers in the gaming industry over a 25 year uh, span uh, in the capacity of operations. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, hopefully, uh, well, I mean, not hopefully, I know that we have a lot of really great experience in the room. So hopefully uh, we can use that experience to, um, yeah, give some real practical tips on on kind of managing stress in work. Um, the first thing that I kind of wanted to go over, and we did hear some experiences yesterday, I would really recommend checking out the um, VOD from that Safe Space Live on YouTube. Um, but what I wanted to go over first was was kind of looking at what stress is and actually how it makes you feel. Because I think that it's very, very common to kind of say, you know, like, oh, I'm I'm so stressed uh, and not really take it seriously. But stress can get to the point where it is quite, um, you know, really quite debilitating. Um, 
so in in as much detail as as you all feel comfortable um i was hoping each of the panelists could tell me about a time that you've experienced stress and and kind of look at you know what caused it how it felt and then how you sort of managed to get over that uh and what i'll do is i'm going to try and like mix it up in terms of who i quote unquote pick on um but julia did you want to kind of go first for this one please um sure i can go first thanks guy um so i'm gonna use a, a COVID example <laughs> i guess probably everybody has one but um in 2020 i was the hr manager of our reflection studio um during COVID, and there was obviously a lot going on at the time it was really difficult to adjust quickly to having the whole team working from home almost overnight. Um, but it was also an adjustment that I had to make personally as well. I was homeschooling my child as well. So that added another complication along with a lot of other parents that were doing that. Um, I was leading our wellbeing program back then as well. So I was one of the main contacts for wellbeing myself as a mental health first aider. So I was um, trying to support a lot of people at one time and um, some days I spent the entire day just having individual well-being meetings and um, eventually it, it took a real toll on me. I didn't really want to admit that for a while. Um, you know, I'd been leading our well-being program for a few years by that point, but during that time, I, I did not feel like a good example of well-being. And as a chronically ill person, I started to experience a lot of symptoms because of the stress. So I wasn't doing well mentally or physically myself, but I was still trying to hide that. Um, and then to top top it all off, my grandmother died in the U.S. in September 2020, and I wasn't able to to travel there to see her at the end or you know attend the funeral because of COVID. And you know she was one of the most important people in the world to me, and I was her next of kin. So I ended up planning her funeral from here and attending virtually, which was not ideal. Um, my my daughter was also experiencing anxiety and sleep issues. So, you know, she wasn't, I wasn't sleeping well either because she wasn't sleeping well. And, you know, I was attending appointments to help her. So, you know, everything just snowballed and it became really far too much for me to handle. But as the HR manager, you know, it was my job to look after the team. And, you know, it was hard to admit that I wasn't in a great place to support other people and that I really had to um, focus on myself and my child and make that the priority priority and that I needed to step back from work. Uh, the timing felt terrible and, you know, I didn't, I felt, you know, awful about it, but I had to speak up. So I told my manager how I was feeling and, you know, he helped me reduce my hours at work temporarily um, and also referred me for some counseling sessions, which really helped me at the time. You know, I did a bit of uh, grief counseling and just tried to focus on how I was feeling and, and work through that. Um, and I was really grateful for the support from him. And, you know, as a manager, I also had to tell my team about what I was going through and, you know, and just let them understand that, you know, I, I needed to, this was something I needed to focus on for a while. And of course they did, you know, because we're always there for each other. And, you know, ultimately we all got through it. It was, um, it was really hard because I, I felt guilty missing work some of the time you know I felt stressed out thinking my team would have less support but I knew in the condition I was in that I wasn't able to really help anyone else at the time anyway and I, I had to focus some energy on on getting well so um so basically I just advocated for myself you know got the medical treatments that I needed I attended all the counseling sessions I I focused a lot on self-care and just trying to you know get to the point where I, I felt well again it was really hard to relax and just kind of get into it you know i just had to keep trying things i think playing a lot of animal crossing you know at some point like eventually kind of helped me because i had something else to focus on but um you know it's uh, i realized coming out of that experience that people who support well-being need a lot of support for themselves as well and you know that we needed more contacts for well-being you know it couldn't all rest on the shoulders of you know a few people so ultimately it's what drove me to launch the well-being champions program in 2021 you know now we've got 37 well-being champions to support well-being so that's spread out so no one person you know should be overwhelmed uh, supporting other people 
school, you know, put in a buddy system in place for our champions so they could support each other, you know, made sure that um, our access to therapy was improved so people could self-refer and that was a smoother process. And in the end, I think the experience that I went through really helped bring about something that was positive, you know, and it, it kind of taught me a lesson, although it was a really tough thing to go through at the time. But, uh, but yeah, that was that was something I, I went through. So Yeah, I mean, firstly, thank you so much for sharing that. And I mean, there's quite a few things that you said there that I'd like to pick up on. And firstly, just the, the kind of place of strength that you need to be coming from to actually admit that you need help. It can be so difficult, especially like you described, if you're in kind of the the role where you're the helper uh, more often than not. Um, so yeah, I mean, like absolutely well done for, for reaching out. And I guess as well, like you've highlighted that stress can come from so many different places. Um, it, it can be work related. It can be familial. It can be health related. It can, you know, like financial, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and and th there are all of these contributing factors towards stress and there might be one thing in particular that that kind of overflows your stress bucket to use that analogy um but you can't just focus on the thing that kind of caused it to be too much you kind of look holistically at all of those different things but yeah taking taking a step back from one element of it and determining which of them is like the most important i.e family stuff um is really really vital so thank you so much for sharing that um Sylv, would you would you be happy to go next and, and tell us a little bit about your experience yeah sure um you kind of touched on it really earlier um you know it's uh, working in in the computer games industry when you're launching a game and in the function of operations that kind of you know traditional bricks and mortar kind of retail um, kind of stock you know that was my kind of arena and making sure that you know the the fans and the community were able to buy the their game on time on the release date that was set by you know the commercial demands of, of the business and you know inevitably it's a creative process and creative processes mean that you know along the way there are bumps that you have to get over and you know QA problems submissions problems you know kind of the technical side of of gaming and inevitably that you know the bottleneck would always fall um within the operations department and our any contingency that we had to play with was continually kind of eaten into. So our kind of lead times would become shorter and shorter and and that crunch time would become, you know, ever more kind of pressurised and kind of, you know, would sit on our department's shoulders. So, yeah, I mean, there were, there were in, incredible moments of pressure, especially with kind of AAA products that, you know, again, there was so much resting on on that kind of release. And I guess for me, my way of coping with it was um, kind of really vocalizing in the moment a lot of the times that, you know, we we needed to get better at kind of trying to avoid kind of um, these intense kind of moment of, of, of pressure trying to get this product out. You know, the reason why we would set specific timelines and and kind of kpis was to avoid that and increasingly as as a business grows um they were being ignored so for me it was because i was running the whole EMEA operations i you know it was my responsibility to ensure that the business understood um the kind of um the pressures that they were putting individuals under which you know you can't sustain over a, a long period of time um, so that was my kind of first thing, really, you know, being kind of a very open and honest and vocal about how things were, were, were being managed. And, and I think personally, what I used to do a lot was and still do is is exercise, getting active and getting away from that situation and allowing yourself that time away from the thing that was causing that anxiety and that feeling of overwhelm um, and kind of taking yourself away and kind of 
doing something active which would then kind of release all the you know natural endorphins and kind of make you feel good in yourself because you'd done something um physical um so yeah that was that was how I used to deal with it a lot and still do I mean for me it's kind of I kind of regard my physical activity almost kind of on a spiritual level because it really takes me away from you know the 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 day-to-day kind of um grind and kind of you know that feeling of you know pressure when that kind of builds um yeah so that's kind of me really and 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 I guess now that I'm a a health and wellness coach I'm very good uh, a little bit like Julia really you're when you're in that function where people look to you to kind of you know um, be that voice of reason and be that support and be that you know empath um in, and supporting them in, in in difficult periods it's really tricky to to kind of practice what you preach because mm-hmm. you 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 constantly want to display that kind of outward strength and that outward confidence and you know you kind of want to lead by example um but it, you know again as julia said there are things that happen in life you know life isn't linear you know there are things that come flying at you that you just do not expect and i think it's your reaction to those things that is really important and i think if you learn how to um set your boundaries understand your triggers i think you know that kind of you know puts you in a good position to deal with those situations that can be incredibly overwhelming in the moment um but yeah that that that's kind of how I deal with it yeah yeah for sure and I mean what you kind of mentioned about identifying the issues and like setting your boundaries is something that we talk about like internally and externally at at safe in our world all the time because you're right like it (coughs) it is really hard to set a boundary and you know say hey I need to take a step back or whatever it happens to be when you are often you know the person who needs to be on and the person that people go to and the person that people are expecting to produce xyz um but even though it kind of feels like you're not displaying strength I think really setting those boundaries is the, you know, the best show of strength that you can really do. And and it sets a good example because, you know, it. I mean, it's always easy to hold yourself to a different standard that you would everyone else. But setting that example will hopefully lead to other people not having to get into really sort of, you know, difficult and potentially damaging situations. Um And I think the other thing that you mentioned was about exercise. And that's something that while we've been having these conversations about stress, whether it was yesterday or on um, our streams or in the training that we've run this month, like carving out that time for yourself, exercise is a really, really good one um, because of the the kind of physical impact, um, as you mentioned, like releasing endorphins and stuff, but just having actual time to yourself um is something that we've really been trying to focus on and i think yesterday and in our training earlier in the week we we looked at like actually put that time in your diary and and make sure you are setting it aside don't just be like oh i'll probably go out for a walk later because you you probably won't Mm because there's always going to be more work to do um so really setting that aside is is super important so thank you for for raising that uh tamsin would you like to to go next um yeah so about five years ago i i burnt out uh didn't think it would happen to me i was always the one at the helm of the business with with my husband we set the business up together um but I was always the one looking after everybody in the business, making sure that everyone else was, you know, not working too long hours and making sure that everyone was kind of healthy and, uh, you know, being OK. And but I had a lot of I had a lot of different roles and we were growing as a business. I was raising our family at the same time, I had some health problems. I had endometriosis. So I was managing that, too. Um, and I, I, I think it when you've got a lot of pulls on your time from a lot of different directions then 
it's only sustainable for so long. Um, but it's quite hard to recognise it in yourself when you're very busy. And even if you do recognise some things, it's quite easy to put it off and think, oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. Um, so it came, a, I think there came a day where I just literally had to stop. So I went to bed and I think I stayed there for about a month. So um, I took about, I think it was six to eight weeks off work. Um I was exhausted, I physically and mentally exhausted. I was really drained, couldn't really function very well. Um, I was, you know, I wasn't really eating very much. I was tired. I didn't really want to talk to anybody. And, yeah, I was kind of surprised. I didn't think that would happen to me. Um, but it did give me an opportunity to have a really good think about, did I want to still do do what I was doing how could I change my behavior it was you know what should I do how can I change how can I how do I not go back to this particular uh, kind of situation um, and I did uh, undertake some counseling possibly should have done it a few years before but I think unless you're ready to undergo counseling then it's not going to be that helpful um, and I remember being asked, well, what gives you joy? What do you do that, that you enjoy? And I, I didn't know. I didn't know anymore because I'd, I'd not been doing anything that I enjoyed for such a long time, you know, because I was so busy meeting everybody else's needs and not my own. So it took me a little while to think about what I wanted to do for, for me um, and also to develop the habits to make time for myself. Uh, because I think again especially when you're a parent it can be quite difficult to do that but equally when you've got caring responsibilities of any type it can be quite difficult to to find that time um, but counselling was a really good thing for me it's helped me reframe all sorts of negative thoughts certain behaviours those those types of things and that's helped me in, in my daily life my work life as well so so I did go back to work um and yeah I mean it's it's guided some of the um attitudes we have to workplace health um we were I'd like to think we were pretty forward thinking anyway but I, th I think that um some of the mental health support that that we offer we've got a good HR manager who cares very passionate about it but lived experience can be really beneficial and um I think one of the key things is that we talk about it we talk about it a lot here and I think that um by talking and being open you kind of remove that stigma and that's super important there's a lot of people that yeah they think things won't happen to them and uh, and then they don't necessarily want to say anything so um yeah so that would be me yeah I'm thank you so much for sharing as well and I think, yeah, burnout, again, something that we talk about so much and to a degree, I I think a lot of people tend to not take it seriously until it has, you know, until you reach the point where it actually has that health effect. You know, I, I've only experienced true burnout once, thankfully, but I was the same as you. Like I, you know, just put it off. I was like, oh yeah, you know, I'm stressed, but I'll get over it. You know, I, I feel terrible all the time, but it'll pass and, and it, and you just keep going. And if you try and push through, like, no, it doesn't pass. It just gets worse to the point where, yeah, you are doing damage to your body and you need to take time off and all this kind of stuff. And I'm glad that you were able to come back for, from it. Um, and, and, you know, start putting things in place so that other people, hopefully don't need to experience it to start taking it seriously I think that having these discussions and kind of really delving into actually what does it feel like and what impact can it have is really important so hopefully people do start to understand and, and kind of identify those signs within themselves so they don't get into that situation I also really liked the the kind of question you mentioned about what do you like to do what brings you joy and and that's probably a good one for everyone to stop and have a bit of a think about um and, and make sure that they are doing that um i'm sure that we've talked about it uh you know safe in our world quite recently but 
sometimes you think that taking a moment for self-care is just you know like giving yourself the time to have a shower in the morning and and we always kind of talk about how there's a difference between just like basic care for yourself as a human being and actually taking time for yourself um and while that might look like a nice long shower if that if you really really like that oftentimes people will mistake basic elements of looking after your body for like taking that moment of self-care but you need to add that like actual self-care and actual time for yourself like above and beyond having your shower or or taking a lunch break or (laughs) any of these wild things that (laughs) um that come up but yeah no thank you so much for for sharing and The next thing that I wanted to talk about was going to look at kind of the workplace specifically. So in your opinions, what are the leading contributors towards stress at work specifically? Uh, Sylv, I will pick on you first for this one. Well, I I guess kind of where I left off, really, I think Certainly in in our industry, I think one of the biggest stresses is the workload and the demand that is placed on 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 teams. And, you know, and I think that's just I don't think that that is unusual of our industry specifically. But I think, you know, it's particularly uh, high on the list of issues that people experience within within the workplace. And. And I guess that's because we are, you know, uh, a fast paced, you know, kind of ever evolving industry. And, you know, I, I think if you've got, um, you know, incredibly successful IPs and, and, and brands, you know, you there are from an organization, you want to springboard off of that and continue that kind of path of success. And and I think what 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 happens is, is that the, the lead times get shorter, the, the demands get bigger. Um, the aspirations also, you know, kind of increase and evolve over time. And, you know, and I think that's any kind of industry. As I said, I don't think specific to ours. I just think that um, we are such a a fast moving and fast paced industry that I think that that for me absolutely sits at the top of, you know, probably the biggest factor in why there is a high level of stress in, in, in the workplace right now. Um, I would also say that actually because of the changing working environment, so because of COVID, going back to to, to Julia's point, is that, you know, our working circumstances have changed quite dramatically. And I think because of that, there has been, there's probably still a little bit of disconnect. You know, people feel a little bit removed from that kind of um, interaction and that kind of ability to have those, you know, water cooler kind of conversations. Um, you know, we had almost three years of disruption, and I think getting back into the routine of, you know, perhaps going back to an office, whatever that looks like, because I think most um, organisations operate a hybrid kind of model. Um, I think people are still kind of getting used to that, and I think because we we kind of created this bubble. Uh, within the working environment when we were all working from home it's taken people quite a long time to get their heads around having to go back and commute and go into an office environment and I think that in itself has created um, a high degree of of anxiety and stress for people Mm. because it's almost like they've forgotten how to do it and you know and with that comes social anxiety and social situations which have almost become alien to us in that period. Um, So, yeah, absolutely a period of readjustment for a lot of people. And I think that that has thrown up. Certainly I've seen it within my coaching business with the people that I see is it's thrown a lot of uh, insecurities and vulnerabilities um, for individuals and, and caused a lot of stress. Yeah. And I think that that some of the points you raised there are really interesting because it's not always going to be one way or the other like it's not just working from home that causes stress it's not just working from the office that causes stress and and you have to be able to find a balance and I mean safe in our world being fully remote um it, it does have its own like challenges because as you said there's none of that like water cooler chat and actually even earlier today um Rosie and I were on a call and 
we ended up like just going off on one and like having a chat and the, we were just on the call together you know like working away in the background and just talking about stuff for like an hour um and and when we kind of realized it we were like oh no like i'm so sorry i've taken up so much of your time blah 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 but then the person that we were on the call with harry stainer um he was like well if we worked in an office like we would just be doing this because if you are in an office environment you do just talk to the people next to you like <laughs> while you're working or you walk away from your desk and you have a chat and s there's so much like i think pressure in this like online meeting 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 environment to like get into the meeting and immediately get down to business and you don't end up having any of those relationships but then like you said when you look at office working therein lies a lot of its own stresses particularly as kind of a shift back but even anyway there's you know a, a huge amount of stress on commuting and you know interacting with people and the financial stress that it might be caused by traveling and like all of this kind of stuff so yeah it's 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 not something that you know you can really pinpoint it's not a black and white subject and and the the things that cause people stress uh, and the ways to resolve that will be different from person to person so yeah thank you thank you for bringing that up um julia would you like to go next and talk to us about your opinions on what causes stress in the workplace sure um well, I think I think workloads need to be balanced and reasonable. I mean, they're they're pressure points and in the right context context that can actually kind of motivate people and feel a bit exciting or enjoyable if you're building towards a target or a milestone over a sort of shorter span of time. But if that takes longer than you expect it to, or, you know, there's not a quieter period to kind of offset that busy time, then, you know, it, it really starts to feel unsustainable to maintain that level of energy. You know, you can't just keep being excited about something that, you know, is it's it starts to drain you rather than feeling, you know, like something that's energizing. So, um, and then I think at that point, relationships start to suffer too, which actually, adds to the stress. So if somebody is already feeling stressed out because of their workload, then they're trying to multitask to get everything done more quickly. They're probably not communicating as clearly as they could be. They might be more likely to make mistakes or misunderstand things, or you know, they might be more irritable or become less patient with others because they're stressed out. And then that also causes friction with their relationships with other people. And then that, you know, adds another layer. And then it starts to have this knock-on impact that affects the team as well, you know, and other people start to get stressed and I think it's um it's a bit contagious you know in a way that way you know a team can can get quite stressed out you know just through this uh, type of process but um and also I think it goes back to what you said Sky that people you know in this industry are so passionate about what they're doing you know they put a lot of pressure on themselves because you know, they care about it so much. Um, and studies show us that the most engaged people are the people that are most likely to experience burnout too. So I think, you know, it's really common in the industry that, you know, developers are, you know, they're passionate about what they're doing. They love making games. You know, sometimes they're doing that even in their spare time after work. You know, a lot of times they're, you know, they're playing games themselves and, you know, it really matters to them that they're creating that great experience for other players. And I think, you know, if you're really passionate about something, you're full of ideas, you're creative, you know, you're thinking about that stuff off work as well, you know, it's harder to switch off. Um, and it starts to become easy to take on too much, you know, which is something I struggle with myself. I'm quite passionate about well-being and neurodiversity. And, you know, I can easily take on a bit too much. And, you know, especially as a neurodivergent person, you know, it's, um, you know, I think it's, I'm even more likely to kind of, you know, just get excited about stuff and jump in, you know, without really stopping, you know, to, to question it. I think Think, you know we've got to kind of stop and ask ourselves do I really need to be doing everything that I'm doing and you know if I say yes to this thing what am I going to end up saying no to in order to fit this in um, you know so like you were saying about boundaries and you know being able to, to speak up and say no um, you know that's it's not an 
always an easy thing for everyone. It's something I'm still learning myself. But I think that, you know, as part of the challenge is that sometimes the, the stress is, is something that we're almost generating ourselves because we start moving faster, adding more things in before we've stopped to stock take about, you know, how much time that might take or, you know, what else might have to um, hang back in order to allow us to do it. So it's, um, yeah, I think it it becomes, it becomes kind of a difficult thing to manage when, um, like in my situation, it's often me that's the problem, <laughs> you know, like causing, kind of causing some of it, you know, because I'm just getting, getting excited about, you know, doing something cool and interesting, but over time, you know, it's, it's too many things. So, so yeah, I think that's, that can be part of the issue as well. Yeah. And I, I think that, you know, the issues you raised about the games industry specifically are really important. And it, it's such a weird thing because this isn't an industry where you're dealing with like life or death situations. And, and you would think like it shouldn't be as stressful as potentially other things. Um, but it, it it's... It's interesting when you look at like the games industry and, and any other kind of entertainment industry and places like that where, you know, you're on such a, a stage in front of the world. And even though if your game is delayed, you know, no one's going to die or like no, no one's going to get hurt or nothing really bad is going to happen. The amount of people who are like watching you and expecting a certain thing and, and the amount of people that you would be sort of quote unquote letting down um it is huge it's an industry where there are a lot of eyes on you so i think that that also causes people to be less inclined to like delay a launch or you know do whatever whatever and, and like you said they just want to get the best product out because not only is there you know a lot riding on it in terms of a lot of people's expectations but also yeah like you said their own expectations and their own desire to do well in an industry that they care very deeply about i think that everyone that i've met in this industry so far has been an intensely passionate person um which is awesome but yeah it does leave you very kind of open to just picking stuff up because you're really excited about it it's something that i do and and like i know rosie from safe in our world does all the time where you know you're just like that sounds so cool yes let's do it this is a great idea and then, you know, a week or two later, you realize, actually, hang on, I can't, this isn't sustainable, I can't do this on top of everything else that I'm doing. So yeah, practicing when to say no is probably a really, really good takeaway from that. So thank you, Julia. Uh, and Tamsin, uh, do you want to give us your thoughts on kind of what causes workplace stress? <laughs> Yeah, so I would say probably there's a couple of things I would pinpoint. And firstly, I think the context is really important. So the industry and the business and the environment. So, you know, the, the games industry is, a, we all know it's a brilliant industry to work in. Um, but actually, when you look at the businesses in, in our industry, a huge proportion are small businesses. So there are some, we've got some big players, but an awful lot of small businesses and that means that they're run by people who may not necessarily have some leadership skills or people management skills they're really brilliant creatively and technically um, but they might not have the full breadth of management training or you know leadership skills and so sometimes the environments can be a little bit challenging to work in that can generate a little bit of stress sometimes they're so focused on getting the product delivered because they need to ship it because they need to get the money in to keep their business running and alive to pay the salaries for the team which is five people who are their best mates that actually it, it is really stressful it's a stressful thing to run a business and be in that environment and when you're working in a small team like that everybody really cares and everybody wants to make it work so actually being in those small teams those small businesses is naturally stressful so that context is super important um obviously it can be stressful working in a big business as well but then also if you start to do well then you're scaling up and scaling up is really stressful too um you know we've been there the last well for quite a few years now but scaling up 
has its own problems. You end up with growing pains, processes aren't keeping up with the rate of pace of growth. You might end up being a bit un under-resourced uh, and then everybody gets a bit miserable because having to do double the work, but, but um, you can't hire quickly enough. So then there's context there. That's really key. And nobody's doing anything out of malice. Nobody's doing anything wrong. That We're just trying to do our best and catch up. But actually, it's it causes stress all around and then you end up with the people around everybody else gets stressed from the person next to them and it's self like a self-fulfilling cycle um but equally you know our industry is so brilliant in that i mean in some ways we're not very diverse but in other ways we're brilliantly diverse you know we have so many different jobs and opportunities we have creative roles art design uh you know some of our programming roles are, i mean phenomenal right um and production and sales and marketing but the people that do all of those roles tend to be very different in the way they work and the way they think and the way they communicate and so sometimes communication and this is my second piece really communication is probably i would say one of the biggest causes of stress and anxiety in the majority of workplaces uh communication lack of uh, inability to do uh, Mars, Venus, people talking in different languages, um, some unable to process it. But, you know, we've got this brilliant industry with loads of different uh, thinkers, different uh, people who communicate in different ways. And sometimes we haven't quite mastered how to translate some of the dialogue, some of the ways in which we need to communicate with each other. So, you know, some of that can be mastered with good process, you know, but we're still relatively mature in some of our uh, processes because we're not, you know, we've not been going 100 years as an industry. So, and, and lots of our businesses have only been going two years or a year or three months. So the processes haven't been written yet. We're, we're doing that as we go along and we make the project. So I think how we communicate with with our teams, with our, you know, with our managers around us, that's really, really key. And a huge part of that is knowing ourselves. A therapist taught me that. Know yourself, understand yourself, what you need, what your boundaries are. Um, and if you can understand that, then you will be able to articulate that, set boundaries and set expectations with other people. But if you don't know that, like what you need, and you don't know that about yourself, it's very, very difficult to help others understand what you need. Um, and, you know, ideally, I'd send everybody to therapy, but it's clearly not financially viable. So, um, you know, we have to all do a little bit of work on ourselves, and we have to all understand ourselves. And we have to make sure that we don't automatically assume that others have bad intent. We have to assume that others have good intent and if something's wrong or if, if we are experiencing stress, let's think, OK, they're not out to get me. They didn't mean to do that. They probably meant something different. Let's work out what it is. And, and so that's what I would say. Communication, I think. Understand yourself and communicate. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, because it's something that I mean, I think about all the time, but. I don't think, it, you know, en enough is kind of practically done toward it, like looking at the different ways that people communicate. And um, I, I was really, really trying to remember because my friend told me about this kind of framework that looks at the styles of communication and how they might clash with each other. Like if someone is an emotional communicator versus someone who is a direct communicator. I can't remember like any details about it. I'll find it after this and I'll put it in the description when we upload this to YouTube if, and if anyone wants to read more about it. But like, it was just very interesting where, you know, neither of those forms of communication is right or wrong, but they can often cause a huge amount of stress. Like you said, you know, if a, direct communicator says something to an emotional communicator and the emotional communicator gets really upset by it and, and thinks that they're in trouble or thinks that someone's angry at them and obviously that's not what is meant but when you don't realize that that's how the communication is being perceived like it it just kind of builds up inside mm -hmm. so yeah like that was that's a, a really really good point and then the other thing that you mentioned about how 
you know, the industry is full of small businesses. I think that's one of the things that through like Safe and Awards Level Up Mental Health Program, for example, one of the things that I think is the most valuable is having a program like that for small companies because of all of the like resources and information that we can provide through that to people who, yeah, they don't have someone to do HR. They don't have a department. They don't have an HR manager. They probably don't have any training themselves in like those types of things. And a lot of people are just kind of muddling through and are going to get things wrong um, through, you know, no ill, Ill intent. Um, but being able to provide those resources, yeah, it's, it's something I'm super proud of. We actually just this week uploaded a template stress risk assessment for our partners to download and use, which was provided very kindly by Julia, who's right here. Um, and it's the, the same template that's used, um, I believe, in the Ubisoft Reflections and Leamington Spa Studios here in the UK. Um, but just, you know, having something like that, a lot of people it's not going to really be on their radar at all that that's something they might need, something they can have, something that's helpful, or even if it is, how to go about it. So being able to kind of just provide that stuff is um, is really important. And, and again, for, for any kind of small companies that might watch this or, or, or take any advice from this, I think seeking out that kind of information and support is, is really crucial. Um, but yeah, I, the next thing that I wanted to talk about, um, kind of, yeah, segueing in really nicely from the resources I was talking about is how do you all manage stress in your respective workplaces? Um, you can talk about your current workplace or you can talk about previous workplaces, whatever you want, but I'd really like to hear um, any, yeah, kind of like top tips or like the best practices that you've experienced of how to manage workplace stress. Uh, Tamsin, I'm going to actually come right back to you first now. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So we have a wellbeing strategy at End Dreams and we we kind of split that into three areas. So we've got um, financial wellbeing, uh, mental health and, and physical health. So we, we, we look at all of those areas. So we've tried to make sure that our compensation and benefits um, policies and framework means that our staff have less less to worry about financially so we have things like death in service and private medical insurance um we have some a financial advisor that will, that comes in a couple of times a year to answer questions over finance and things like that because money is a big source of stress for people we know we know that and especially with the cost of living situation as it is now um you know we know that that causes a lot of st stress um, for people all over so we do try and you know we try and focus on that as a specific area um, in terms of mental health for, for staff we've got a large number of mental health first aiders mental health champions um, we have a well-being room on site in our in our office so that people can take time out and you know if, if they just need a break that's uh, it, it's a good source of uh, quiet for them there are um sensory aids for neurodivergent people if they need to access that space as well um my favorite thing is it, again office space we have a giant teddy bear so if anybody just needs a cuddle then they can cuddle the teddy bear um but we have you know we have counseling as part of the health insurance as well um so there are there are things like that that we have in place. We've also got um, on our intranet lots and lots of access to resources and, and wellbeing resources that people can access. Um, and we make sure that, that staff are getting regular one-to-ones with their line managers. They've got access to the HR team and obviously the mental health first aiders if they need it. And then from a physical wellbeing point of view, um, because again, we know that if you haven't got a healthy body, you're not likely to have a healthy mind. Um, we, we've got the private medical insurance. We've also got cash back policies for things like um, dental and opticians, because we want to make sure people are looking after themselves all over. Um, we've got a couple of staff who've set up a, a running group and some, some of the teams do things like badminton and, and sports outside. I'm not very sporty myself, but um, 
you know, that there's other things like that. So I think, yeah, from a physical perspective, we have we have fruit and stuff in the office, but really we're trying to teach people that they have to take care of themselves rather than us taking care of them. So we'll we'll have quite a lot of uh, speakers come in and talk to them about, you know, what they can do at our last summer festival. We had uh, kind of massages and sometimes we'll do yoga sessions and stuff. So um, it's not every week, you know, we, we balance it out, but we do try and support the teams where possible. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it sounds like you're doing a huge amount, which is really awesome to to hear. Um, but it was it was really nice as well through everything you described. There's like a lot of, you know, you're offering a lot of different things and, and hopefully through all of those examples, there are things that, you know, it would be easier for smaller companies to pick up on or, or companies that are already doing quite a lot, they can pick up on some of the other stuff. So it's nice to have like that kind of, mix of the I don't really want to use the word easy wins but like easy wins it doesn't versus... it doesn't always have to be expensive you can exactly. put on things that are free or cheap and you can still look after your staff you don't have to expend lots and lots of money on yeah. really expensive policies yeah absolutely like the the running club you mentioned and I know one of our other level up partners Ripstone do a walking club where just I think it's like every Tuesday they just all go on a walk together and that kind of stuff is so important and really just super easy to implement. Um, I will just pause here for for a sec to say thank you so much to End Dreamers in chat for the £50 donation to Safe in Our World. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah very Amazing. very exciting. Um, yeah, thank you. And also, I can see Bacardi Am put uh, a really important comment in there as well about, you know, factors that can implement workplace stress. Um, she said, I think change, uh, change can be another factor too, especially for neurodivergent people, but some mental health issues can also have a bad reaction to change. And yeah, I think the way that people manage change, like the way in which it's implemented and communicated and maintained can be a huge factor and it's certainly like for me throughout my entire working life been a huge factor in the times that I have felt the most stressed have been the times where there's been a significant amount of change that has been like poorly communicated and and things like that so I'm you know very much a person that likes to know exactly what's going on all the time (laughs) so when that kind of gets you know that when there's upheaval there um, it can be really really stressful um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tamsin. Um, Sylph, would you like to, to give us some ideas about implement like things that you've implemented uh, to manage stress in the workplace? Uh, yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the things have been covered already. Um, but I think creating community, I think uh, creating space for people to talk about how they're feeling and you know, kind of just feel like they have support of some description. It's not about bringing um, expensive kind of initiatives in necessarily. But I think if your kind of um, your team have this open uh, forum that they can express themselves freely and openly, I think that in itself is, you know, gold dust, really. I think it it really is the kind of... um, hugging your team without kind of having to to, to put these expensive things in place. Um, I think it's important that as a team, you you perhaps take yourselves outside of your working environment and create a kind of more fun and collaborative kind of environment to get to know each other. Because I think that's another thing, again, we've, we've kind of touched on it already, that we're so kind of entrenched in kind of the task in hand and the kind of objective, the business objective, we don't necessarily have time to kind of get to know each other on a personal level. And I think if we, if businesses perhaps think about 
team building exercises and fun things you know kind of uh, one of my clients strangely took their team to uh, a circus skills uh, event recently and um, strangely saw some of that team yesterday and they w- had nothing but great things to say about it and how excited and fun it was and there was no kind of expectation um, and it was an environment where you know there none of them had ever done anything like that before so there was hardly any competitiveness it was kind of a fun day that they could use to bond and kind of really get to know each other on a personal level as well so I think things like that are really important and you know I love the idea of the whole walking meetings thing and kind of organizing just small things like that that can really change the way you're kind of working and kind of think of creative ways of doing things that achieve things from a commercial and kind of business perspective but also kind of there's a fun element and there's a kind of um, an opportunity to kind of do something outside of the norm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's all of those lovely things that uh, Tasman had said. And, you know, I mean, the you know, the, all of those initiatives are amazing. And I think a lot of corporations do that now. And certainly from my experience, when I was uh, working for, for publishers, that's exactly all of the things uh, that we had in place as well. So... Yeah, I think that that's a lovely point. And when you really like get to know each other, um, it it will naturally start to bridge those gaps with like what Tamsin was saying about communication and all that kind of stuff. Because you'll you'll understand the people that you work with so much better, and you'll also start to feel more able to speak up if you are having an issue um so yeah the bonding is is really crucial i love the idea of like the circus um training you mentioned um but yeah there there are so many different ways to do it that you know cost money that don't cost money all that kind of stuff and it it does make such a massive difference because i mean even earlier this week for example i think on like tuesday i said to Um, our manager Sarah and my colleague Rosie on our call I was like I'm gonna take a little bit longer for my lunch today because I just want to go like to there's a lake like nearby I just want to go to the lake and like have a walk because I really just I'm starting to feel a bit overwhelmed and I just need to get away and not be anywhere near like my house or my pc for a minute um so I'll you know I'll be back at this time I'm gonna take uh longer than I normally would and I I, I definitely don't think I would have said anything like that in a previous workplace. Um, but because, you know, there isn't that kind of stigma associated, like, in the company culture, which you would hope for a mental health charity, but still there isn't that, like, stigma around, you know, if you finish early, if you take too long on a break, you're not working hard enough, blah, blah, blah. And also because, like, I know my team well and, and we've, you know, had that period of getting to know each other. Because I also probably wouldn't have said that like in my first week on the job because I wouldn't have felt comfortable enough to. Um, But yeah, like implementing actual like ways to bond as a team um, is super, super valuable, I think. Um, Yeah, uh, Jake in chat says, supporting each other just makes it all round so much better and easier. Um, and Bacardi answers the team building stuff and the activities you mentioned would also just make, you know, make you feel valued as an employee and an individual, which in turn, you know, can help to reduce stress because a lot of pressure can be added when you feel like you're doing everything to get no- nothing out of it. And, it, you know, like the company doesn't care about you and all that kind of stuff. So So feeling valued is a massive factor in like, job satisfaction and and therefore stress um julia would you like to tell us about your kind of strategies and things that you've implemented sure um so our our overall well-being program strategy um is based around safety awareness prevention and support so um safety is all about just you know having an inclusive workplace where people feel safe to be themselves but it's also about creating that safe to speak up culture you know letting people know you know that it's that it's okay and 
you know, making sure that's in place. So we have um, a health and well-being policy, you know, that um, makes that pretty clear that we'll support anyone who's, you know, who who speaks up, you know, that, um, you know, we we're aiming to, you know, get rid of stigma in the workplace and that kind of thing. So we're, we're pretty open about that. The sickness absence policy says it's okay to take time off for mental health reasons, and it's the same as physical health. So we make that very clear as well. Um, and I think, um, you know, you've got to have awareness as well to get the safe to speak up culture going. So, you know, just raising awareness that, you know, we all have mental health, we all go through things, you know, just sitting here on this call, you know, we've been sharing things and it's, you know, it's amazing how much you find out about people and how much you actually have in common when you start to open up and talk about it, you know, and just and share what you're going through. You know, that's um, it just brings us all together. And I think it's, you know, it really helps a lot to to just kind of open up about that and you know you don't need a big budget to to do that really you just have to have a few you know a first few willing volunteers to kind of get the conversation going and then it, it flows from there I think quite easily um with prevention um it's really important. So for us, I think, um, you know, using things like the stress risk assessment template that we shared with you, um, you know, when you when you look through that, you can actually identify points of pressure before they come up, you know, and, and develop a plan to offset that. I mean, we're obviously a bigger company, but, you know, if we know we're going to be working with a team in a different time zone, for example, then we know that's going to be a stress point for our team, you know, that are they going to be having meetings, you know, later than they normally would or, you know how is that going to work? What's what do we need to to do to kind of work work through that um, and talk to them about the challenges? How would it impact them? You know, work with them to find solutions to to mitigate that stress before it comes up. You know, if you know that's going to happen, then you know just develop a plan around it before it occurs, rather than waiting until it's a problem. Um, and then I think you know having things in place like a flexible you know, flexible working policies, you know, we've got flexi time policies. So, you know, that really helps people offset those short term pressures, you know, if they did need to stay late to fix something one day or, you know, do a task, then they can bank that extra time and finish early, you know, a few days later or, you know, take a half day on Friday the following week, you know, we've got our set up that way so that, you know, it allows people that chance to work a bit less one week or a bit more, you know, another week if, you know, if that were to, to be held helpful for them. Um, and I think that makes a big difference. You know, we've got core hours in place for meetings, but within that, there's a lot of flexibility. You know, there's no rush to get to work by 9 a.m. or, you know, whatever. Like some days I start at 10, some days I start at 9. It just depends on what's going on and, you know, the school runs and that kind of thing. So, you know, just allowing that flexibility so that people can, you know, work around uh, life, you know, and just have that good work-life balance because we're all different. You know, some people love waking up early and starting work at eight you know and that's uh that's not for me <laughs> so you know just being able to kind of work around that you know and, and be flexible i think is really great um and then you know having the support in place is so important you know we've got the well-being champions team we have a, a therapy provider plum health uh, which you know people can use for support and just making sure that people are aware of the support that's available that it's you know it's there for them that you're reminding them that it's there because it's easy to forget um you know and that kind of goes back to the awareness um thing where you're just you know raising awareness about about the services that are there and i think even if you know even if you're a small employer you know you can you can set something up you know you can also look for local you know support groups and and other things that are nearby you know i know here in the northeast there's anxious minds for example you know that's a place that people could use you know just try and do a little bit of research and find out you know where where can people go if they need some support if you can't afford to put something in place right now what's going to be you know what else could they do you know how do they self-refer to counseling through the nhs in that area you know just look that stuff up and make sure you've got the you know the 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 details available you know you can refer them to relate or you know another service like that that they could potentially use um instead you know if you can't set something up right now you know what what could you do um where 
what kind of um, suggestions could you give them? So I think, um, you know, those are all uh, great ways just to kind of think about a process. You know, how are you going to prevent stress? You know, how are you going to support people? How are you going to create a, a safe and inclusive workplace where people feel it's OK just to say this is too much and I, I need some help? You know, it's um, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think there are a few different I'm trying not to forget everything immediately but there are a few different things you mentioned there that that I thought were really good I mean the first one being actually having this stuff written into policy um because that way like it just adds that extra layer of like safety from the perspective of the person who might want to bring some bring something up you know um knowing that they can knowing that they can from the beginning and then you know, within that, having it in the policy and as you later mentioned, like reminding people about it um, will mean that, you know, it's never just like lost information. I remember in a previous workplace, I had no idea that there was actually stuff in place to help manage workplace stress until my stress had gotten so bad that I'd spoken to my union rep and they were like, oh, you can do like an individual stress risk assessment and have like adjustments and stuff put in place by your manager and I'd never heard of that and none of my colleagues had ever heard of that and it's something that was you know well established and there was processes in place for it but because no one talked about it or it wasn't in like all of the policy stuff you get given at the beginning when you start the job and all that like people just kind of didn't know and they forget um and then the other thing you mentioned about like just understanding provisions like yeah, not everyone's going to be in a position to have healthcare or an employee assistance program or all this kind of stuff. But having a, a decent knowledge of stuff that is available, uh, I mean, safeinourworld.org has a lot of provisions that, that are kind of uh, collated for, for different resources and reasons um, that are available internationally. But even just having a look at what's around in your local area, I mean, I... I had to get really clued up on local provisions for a previous job that I had, um, you know, where I, I was constantly having to signpost people who were in need of support. And even now I still have that kind of mental bank of, of stuff so that if anyone like, you know, my friends in the area and stuff, if they need help, I, I kind of already have an idea of where they can go. And as an employer having that um, where possible can really help because even if it's not something you are offering being able to take that person in need and kind of help guide them towards something that might help is really valuable and especially I guess to the person experiencing it because oftentimes when you're really stressed or where you're like you know in mental health crisis or you're really struggling you are the least prepared and the least equipped to go and find help yourself right um so yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much for, for raising that. And just to kind of round off the stream, what I'd really like to know as my final question to you all is, we've talked about a ton of different ways of managing stress and like different types of stress and all of this stuff. And there has been so much really good information here. But what I'd like to know from each of you now is like, what would be your key takeaway for anyone watching in terms of how they can support you know people experiencing stress in the workplace um it doesn't have to be like one thing if there's like a, a you know two things maybe three um but just as a as a more succinct kind of action point what would you recommend that folks do um so if we will go with you first for this one please i think for me um just openly saying to someone it's okay to not be okay and to talk openly and to be that person to give support. I think signposting is is vital in any organisation in, in, in kind of identifying and being able to kind of show people where they could, could go for help or turn towards in those, in those moments. Um, but yeah, I think my biggest thing is, is kind of having somebody that is open and you know kind of uh willing to, to to listen to you without judgment without um kind of um sorry i'm having a, a moment here um 
But I think um, leading by example as well, actually, I think that's another big thing um, is, you know, it's all good and well with all these policies and everything. But I think senior management have a responsibility to kind of show the way and making sure that people are taking holidays and um, time off and being flexible and all of those things. But we have to see that from top down. Um, so, yeah, that that would be my kind of uh, main thing. Yeah, thank you. And no, that's a, a really, really good point. Um, I'm all for, you know, demonstrating this kind of stuff from the top down. And when it comes to like, those tougher conversations, it is really, really important. Because I'm sure a lot of, you know, like employees on the same level, colleagues will talk to each other about how stressed they are all the time, you know, you end up with that really good relationship with the people who are kind of on your same hierarchical level. Um, but hearing it from you know, people higher up the kind of chain of command, so to speak, uh, kind of really like contributes towards fostering that safe space. Um, Julia, would you like to, to go next? Um, yeah, I think as an individual, um, you know, we, we talked about boundaries, but I think you can't really underestimate the importance of that. You know, there's only so much we can reasonably do and, you know, we have to be able to set those boundaries and, you know, um, do what we can to, to, you know, think about what matters to us, you know, what's, what are our values, what, you know, where is this taking us and, and really focus on the things that are most important to us. And I think, um, you know, our time's the most valuable resource we have. So we've got to take ownership of that. Um, I also think people should really look at, you know, um, your own coping strategies as well, you know, to relieve stress and be honest about whether or not that's actually helping you right now, or is that somehow adding to the stress? Because if, if you're stressed, but you're, you know, increasing your use of alcohol to try and feel more relaxed, then that's going to affect your sleep and ultimately might make you feel worse. So just thinking about, you know, how you are going to relieve stress in your life and, you know, what are the the most hope, helpful coping strategies that you, you have, you know, like going for walks or, you know, playing games, something that's not going to, you know, ultimately make things worse, I think is is a really important point because it's, it's one that we can often get caught up in, you know, where you think I just, you know, I need to relax when I have this glass of wine and then, you know, it just goes on from there. So it can actually make things a bit worse sometimes if, you know, you're doing that. But, um, you know, and just if you're feeling stressed, I think do a do a big brain dump, you know, write it all out. And if it's helpful, get somebody else to look at it with you and ask you some questions about it, you know, and just kind of question you. Is this outside of is it something you can do something about? Is it outside of your control? You know, you might realize that some of the things that you're stressed about, you know, they're they may or may not happen, you know, or, or it might be further in the future if it does happen. You know, and if that's the case, then try to put that stuff aside and just you know, come back to it later and, you know, just really hone in on the things that you really need to think about right now and, and do right now and, and just work through it that way, I think is good. But the main thing is just being able to speak up, you know, I wish I'd said something sooner, you know, when, when this happened to me. Um, and I think, you know, it's, you know, it's just important to to advocate for yourself and be willing to say, I need some help. You know, I can't I can't do it all right now. And, you know, I need some help with this and, and to get the support that you need. Yeah, thank you. And no, I, I completely agree. It's, uh, you know, activities like the stress bucket, which I mentioned earlier, uh, doing what you say about visualizing that stress, like seeing where it comes from, looking at what your coping skills are for that. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, f I'll link to something that explains the stress bucket when we put this onto YouTube, but yeah, just like having that time to sit down and think like, what am I stressed about? What are like the big things that I'm stressed about? Or like you said, the things that are in my control, the things that are out of my control, what are like the little things that do happen or could happen that might, you know, be the kind of tipping point for that stress for me? Cause you know, you might have all of the stuff like bubbling on right under the surface and then like a traffic jam is what like makes it unbearable for you. Uh, and it's not really the traffic jam. It's everything that is, you know, underneath that. Um, but yeah, I identifying when coping mechanisms and, and coping strategies might not be helpful um, 
is really important, especially when you've got into like you've formed a habit around, um, you know, the glass of wine or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, so yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And then uh, lastly, Tamsin. Well, I think I think for individuals. Um, what I said before about really starting to know yourself and understand yourself is is quite key. And if if you are experiencing stress and uh, you're starting to struggle, just remember that you can't always change the situation that you're in, but you can change how you respond to the situation that you're in. So um, I think you know, speak to, speak to your friends or your colleagues, and you know, try and work out what you can control and what you can't but how you re respond and think about reframing it is there a positive slant that you can possibly take away um but how you how you look and how you move forward will determine how you how your feelings um are going to work and then i think for employers you know we've got an obligation to facilitate our, our teams and our staff to be working in positive healthy environments and we can't make everybody happy and healthy but we can try and provide the environments for that safety and that um you know that positive experience and if if we don't know how to do it we need to go and find out we need to go and use resources like safe in our world who are you know they've got a massive catalogue of resources now so we need to go and find out um what's there and then i think for all of us um, I, I go back to the mental health first aid training that I had, which I would recommend for anybody as brilliant. Um, you can't always fix somebody's problems, but what you can do is you can you can listen, you can assess the risk that somebody might be under, you can listen to them, and you can encourage them to go and get some support from the right places. But don't take it all on yourself. You can't fix something for somebody else. They have to do that themselves. But you can signpost them to the right support. You can offer, you know, you can offer to be there with them. And sometimes that's all that somebody needs. Yeah, thank you so much. That was, oh, that was very poignant. That like got me. Um, but you're right. And, and I, I think especially about like, similarly to what Julia was saying as well, when, when you said, look at whether the stress is like something that you can control. I am super prone personally to getting stressed about stuff that I can't control and I also think that you know when you look at finances some of that is within our control yeah but if you look at finances in a bro more broad sense or like environmental stuff or like political stuff like all of this stuff like adds stress but ultimately it it's oftentimes outside of our realm of influence so yeah like reframing how you look at it and and how you consider it and that kind of stuff is is so much. I can see Bacardi Ann in chat put a hundred percent, and then Jake put a hundred and nine percent. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I I also one hundred and nine percent agree with that statement. Um, yeah. No. I mean, thank you all so so much for joining, and thank you to everyone in chat who's been sort of yeah contributing and commenting throughout I've read out a few of them but it's just it's been really nice to to see the conversation in there um what I will do now is I'll, I'll give you each um a minute to uh let people know where they can find you uh if you want to be found um <laughs> and also give you an opportunity if there is anything cool you've got going up you know individually as part of your organization um then feel free to tell people and and we can collate the links and, and put everything below but um i mean tamsin first thank you so much for joining us was there anything that you wanted to let people know about um yes yeah, so end dreams have got some great games coming up in the next uh, the next six months, we've got sign-ups coming out. Uh, we're going to have Ghostbusters coming out, uh, both VR games. Um, I do some work with Intergames, uh, an organisation um, working on accessibility into the games industry. So look at their website because that's great. I also do some work with Autistica Play. They're a brilliant organisation. Uh, Autistica are great. So 
uh, support them if you can. Safe in the world, our world are obviously great, so keep an eye on them. Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm Tamsin All. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and Julia, is there anything you want to tell people before we leave? Um, well, if you want to send me a message on LinkedIn or, you know, ask anything, then definitely feel free to to do that. Um, otherwise, you know, just keep supporting Safe in Our World. And, you know, if they're, um, we're always looking for, you know, some some great um talent you know so if you if you want to come and work for our studios then definitely take a look at the roles we've got open and you know get in touch about that and um and yeah that's that's it really oh hell yeah thank you i can see jake in chat as well just got really excited about ghostbusters vr um, <laughs> um i don't actually know what the release date is by the way so oh, okay. don't hold me don't hold me to that six months it might be eight or nine or ten that's or fine. twelve that's fine so, at least pe at people know to look out. out for it it's fine yeah. um and and self what have you got going on is there anything you want to say before we go uh, yeah, so as you know, I'm a health and wellness coach and it's kind of a holistic approach and looks at the kind of uh, full body kind of uh, experience. Um, I also, uh, just to let everybody know, run uh, corporate retreats. So we look at the wellness space within that. And um, yeah, there's spiritual elements as well that we cover, you know, which is uh, quite important to uh, well-being. Um, and if anyone wants to get in touch, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and like I said, we'll, we'll pop all of those links um, on YouTube so that everyone can uh, can find everyone. Bacardi Anne's just put another 109% agree in, in, the, in, the, in the chat. But yeah, thank you everyone so much for joining us this month. Um, this will be available on YouTube probably next week um and yeah like thank you panelists thank you everyone for thank for joining you. you've really contributed like so many awesome things we covered so much in like an hour and a half i'm actually really surprised um because we've yeah we've talked about a lot of different things but it has been it's been awesome for anyone watching um just a reminder if you are struggling with anything um or you feel like you need some help then you can go to safeinourworld.org um, to access a whole host of international resources um, and, you know, just get some information and also read some stories and, and hear about other people who may have been through something similar because um, that can help, you know, as we've spoken about here even, it can help a lot to know that other people have been through these things and, and to have that open conversation about it. Um, but otherwise, we will see you at the end of May for another panel and yeah, take care. Bye everyone. Thanks guys. Thanks everybody. Bye.